Li Shangjing, Climbing Leo Heights. Toward nightfall, ill at ease, I urge my carriage up the ancient heights. The evening sun has boundless beauty, but now it is about to set. So we continue with the pentasyllabic uh, quatrains, and we move on now to Li Shangjing. Nothing need be said about him. We've talked uh, about him in previous uh, videos. He is the fourth best represented poet in this anthology, immediately after Du Fu, Li Bai, and Wang Wei, with more than 20-something poems, I believe. And uh, in this case, he has a, a short quatrain here. And uh, I wouldn't say it's pretty, I wouldn't say it's very hermetic. I think it's pretty transparent. First thing we need to clarify is Leo Heights. What is that? So I've been doing some checking and it seems that Leo was one, the Leo Heights were one of the parked areas in the imperial capital in Shang'an where scholar officials strolled and enjoyed their free time. There was a very famous park on the southeast of the capital bordering the southeastern walls the Serpentine, and we've encountered poems about that area in this anthology, I believe, by Du Fu. Another park was the Leo Heights. The Leo Heights was in the eastern half of the city, just below the eastern market, so not too far away, in fact, from the Serpentine. Uh, it's called the Ancient Heights because if what I read in some um, internet spaces is true, already long before the Tang Dynasty, this area had already been used. Uh, it might have had a temple uh, or some sort of construction or pavilion, even from as far back as the Han Dynasty. Remember, the Western Han Dynasty also had its capital in this area. It was also called Chang'an. It was slightly mm, placed in a slightly different position, I think a bit to the northwest of Tang, Chang'an, but relatively close. Uh, so some of its ruins might still have been visible at, at, uh, in, Tang, uh, in Tang times. So this Leo is a, a parked area in a slight elevation, so I imagine that not only would it be a beautiful garden place with trees and flowers for strolling, it would have given a very good view of the whole imperial capital at its feet. From there it would have been easy to see the pagodas, the, the, the palaces, uh, the, 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 the walls, Relatively close to it are two of the surviving buildings, the only surviving buildings from the Tang capital, the, the Great Goose and the Small Goose Pagoda, from huge Buddhist establishments. So in these Leo Heights, not only the sites in the Heights in that parked area, but the sites from the Heights, that is the Imperial capital, would have been pretty impressive. So what's the topic of this poem? The, the poem does not describe landscape viewing of the imperial capital. Actually, it only describes sunset. So especially the second couplet, as we will see in a minute when we talk about the poem couplet by couplet, the second couplet is a description of the beauty of sunset, or of the evening sun just before it disappears, just before it sets. And uh, so, so that's the topic. It's uh, appreciation of nature. Uh, the late evening sun, just before it's about to set, and its beauty. There's also a sad, melancholy tone to it that is made explicit in the first part of the poem, in the first couplet. It's nightfall, which, remember, it's, well, it's late evening towards nightfall, which is the saddest time of day in Chinese poetry, and it's generally equated with other images of decline, of impending uh, physical decline and death, like the season of autumn or, or, or other elements. And the poet explicitly says he's feeling ill at ease as he is climbing to the elevation. So beyond the landscape description of a late evening sun, there's also an implicit undercurrent of melancholy and sadness, which the image of the setting sun should probably emphasize or, or, or maybe concretize in a, in a visual and natural correlate of an intellectual or subjective feeling of decline and uh, of decline and fall. So those are the topics of the poem. Uh, let's take a look at it couplet by couplet. It's a very short poem, but uh, I think the overtones that it has 
can be read in many different and interesting ways. So first couplet. Toward nightfall, ill at ease, I urge my carriage up the ancient heights. So the first couplet starts with an elevation. We don't, well, we know from the title that the poet is climbing Lidio Heights. He's not climbing them on foot, he's climbing them on a carriage. And we have a lot of poems. I'm thinking of one that comes to mind is uh, one by Sao Xi in, at the beginning of the, of the period of this union. But there are lots of poems of, I think there are hand poems as well, of like the scholar official going in his carriage and going up some elevation which has to be paved or have some sort of a pathway, otherwise the horses and the chariot wouldn't be able to pull it upwards. Remember, moving to heights is always associated with the acquisition of insight. We've mentioned this in tons of poems that included climbing mountains, climbing towers in this anthology. So the carriage is going up. The poet urges his carriage to climb the ancient heights to get insight and... Uh, Two important things. It's nightfall, so it doesn't seem like the best time of day when nightfall is approaching to actually climb the mountain, unless this is meant to be a metaphorical climb. And the poet is not feeling very well. He's ill at ease. There is some unease in him that is pushing him up the mountain, and that probably is explaining uh, what he is seeing, why he is seeing it, and how he is interpreting it. So... The poet climbs up the mountain in his carriage. What does he see? Well, that's the second couplet. And there's basically one, only one image, only one thing that focuses his attention and that acts as the emblem of the poem. The evening sun has boundless beauty, but now it is about to set. So the most beautiful sight, the focalizer of the poet's attention once he is in on the top of the Leo Heights, is just the sun. It's... A beautiful sun, it has boundless beauty, but it's setting. Now, sunset is a pretty universal image of the client, not specifically Chinese. So, when we try to decipher or interpret any possible meanings of this poem, what will this sun, sun setting represent? Now, um, uh, I believe you, you, there are different layers of, 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 of meaning, different ways of interpreting this poem. There are pretty satisfactory in themselves. So, yeah, from one point of view, you would not need to read this as metaphorical. You know, you could take this as, you know, literal. Like, the poet has climbed up this mountain. He wasn't feeling too well for whatever reasons which are not explained. And out of all the sights he sees in the relaxing, beautiful Leo Park, the one that captivates him the most is the setting sun, a beautiful golden disc uh, when it's setting, probably surrounded by reds and purples and all all the marvelous um, chromatic effects that the setting sun displays, and the sun setting. So, a beautiful sight, you know, just a beautiful sight in nature that moves the poet. And then that makes him think of, of how brief and uh, how pleasurable this beautiful sight is. But as I said, again, the image of the setting sun has been used in all cultures, I think, or almost all cultures, metaphorically, as a metaphor, as a symbol for other sorts of decline. Here it could be used in different ways. Perhaps it could be used um, from a personal perspective. I don't know how old Li Shangjing was. We saw when we talked about his life and in previous poems that he had a very checkered and ultimately frustrating and unsuccessful political career. So the setting sun might be the setting sun of his ambition or the setting sun of his life. If this poem was composed when he was feeling old and ill, maybe this ill at ease is connected to his aging and his feeling of uselessness or worthlessness, of lack of success. So this beautiful, sad sun that is setting could be acting as a metaphor for himself or his aspirations. I'm a great, uh, capable man, a great writer. Probably, if I had been given the chance, a great scholar official, but now my sun is setting uh, amidst the beauty of poetry like this that I compose or, or sites that I enjoy. But... Uh, with an ultimately frustrating and unsuccessful outcome. It is very tempting. Li Shangjing is, is generally considered the best poet of the late Tang period, the period of decline and decadence when amidst the incompetent emperors and uh, greedy officials and peasant rebellions, uh, the empire pretty, pretty quickly mm, strolled towards its dissolution and its dismemberment. And... Uh, it's very easy to interpret this, this image of the setting sun 
or to be able to read it as a, a metaphor for the dynasty itself. Li Shangjing lived after uh, the, the, the attempts of restoring the empire during the Yuanhe era. He saw the decline, the infighting, the eunuchs controlling power, the, glory and the increasing unrest, the, the courtly factions. And he could be reflecting in this poem that the sun of his dynasty is in its evening. The empire is slowly going towards its disappearance or its temporary breakup. So that's another image, uh, that, or, or at least if this is not a reading that is implied in the original or felt by the author, it's a very easy reading for us contemporary readers who know what happened to Tang China not so long after Li Shangjing's death. Anyway, whatever way you choose to read or interpret it, it's a very nice, concise and visual poem with these echoings of Anis uh, and with this beautiful image of the setting sun falling disappearing, leaving us without a trace of its boundless beauty.